So inform us what you do. Always bring up to you with time and experience. Yes. What you do. Yes. So inform us what you do, who you are. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. All yes. the bullet points. I, um, my name is Linwood Bibbins. I'm the CEO and founder of Reach TV. Reach TV is a streaming television network um, in 90 airports across the US, 2,400 gates, 900 venues, and also streaming into 500,000 hotel rooms across the US. Um, we really air a lot of live sports. We're the only network with every NFL game, playoffs, and Super Bowl for the next seven years. We're the only minority-owned business that has any of those games. Um, we have the NBA, WNBA, college football, college basketball, both men and women, uh, live golf, and a bunch more stuff. Um, and I think uh, the, the idea behind this was how do we own a fragmented audience and put them all together? That was our original business plan, and that's how we got to where we are today. Um, well, I'm sorry to interrupt yeah. you. We'll ask if anybody has questions for him. Yeah, exactly. Okay. okay. Um, and being that this is, you know, over diversity and what we're doing here and as a, you know, both music and, and, and television have very similar things, which is rights. You know, it's about how do you acquire those rights. But I'll go backwards. I started in uh, computers and consumer electronics back in, I'm going to date myself here, uh, back in the early 90s, I was doing mail order uh, magazines for Computer Shopper magazine for the older people here. They know how thick it was. Uh, that's how I launched my first business. Um, we ended up selling that in three years uh, to our biggest supplier. Uh, I, I moved from a B2C to a B2B company. In that, I learned how to operate inside of that. And in, in 96, I decided, you know, this internet thing is going to be kind of cool. And I left with two people, and we started a company called PickADW.com, which was really, um, at that time, was revolutionary. It was six deals a day. That's it. And so we ended up, uh, three of us, one was 14-year-old, my buddy's son, who's, who's, a, who's a web wizard, and built our website. And in 18 months, we grew it to $40 million in 18 months. Um, uh, then merged, with, again, with my biggest supplier and created a $100 million company, which we sold in 99. Um, and then from there, I really saw that I saw both sides of both B2B and B2C. Um, and then I launched the company again uh, with a bigger emphasis on how do I help? How can I use my expertise to help uh, value-added resellers, smaller minority-owned businesses, scale up to their full potential, the contracts they get? There's a lot of government contracts that go to diverse-owned businesses, but the problem is we don't have the finances or the monies to actually complete those. So I was running into people that had $10 million contracts but only had the financing to do two or three. So we had grown our business, and I took every one of them to, it's funny, again, I'm going to age myself. It was called Comdex, and now it's called CES. But at that, I asked everyone to write on a piece of paper their total contract and how much we do. That was all my meetings. They were, they were five-minute meetings. Just write on this piece of paper, come back tonight for a party. And everybody came in and left, and I said, I looked at the sheets, and the difference is $150 million. I'm here to announce we're going to finance all of that. A big party, and then we actually took our revenue from uh, 97 million to 242 million inside of 12 months. So, what I would say is that you know, one of the things that we deal with in, ge in general is financing and an inability to understand how to scale. And those are two things that I've really have focused my career on f figuring out how to do those two things. And you've been very successful, yes. Uh, <laughs> and then, I, you know, in 2008, I just said, I'm tired of seeing computers. I can't see another computer. I don't care anymore. Mm -hmm. And I sold the company back, my ownership back to my partners. And I was like, I'm going to, I don't know what I'm going to do. Mm -hmm. And a good friend of mine named Payne Brown, which is kind of funny, we're talking about the FCC here. Mm -hmm. He was at Comcast. And Comcast had launched their new offices in Philly. So I just got to sit and hang out. So I'm in the building, which I don't know why I'm there. Mm -hmm. Payne liked me, but I'm with, he's the SVP the president of television, the president of connectivity, their boxes. And we spent five months having these strategic meetings. And at the end, I presented. And I presented what I called some digital stuff, I'd automated advertising. I thought it was really smart. And they all got up and they were laughing. They were looking at each other. I'm like, what's the joke? And they went underneath everything I said and said, we're too big to buy any one of these 
things you're talking about, mm -hmm. but what we can buy is every piece of broadband. And the next day they announced a $2.6 billion purchase of broadband. So when you talk about who has a dominant force in there, Comcast understood what was happening before it happened, mm -hmm. and that's where they win. their win is, they have enough money to go buy up the broadband. And then they leverage everyone on the other side, they just buy the winners. Mm -hmm. So understanding how the game is played is one of the biggest problems that we usually have. And I've been fortunate enough to sit in a room to see how that was played. Um, and then after that, I was kind of like figuring out what I wanted to do. And a good friend of mine who worked for um, Steven Spielberg at uh, DreamWorks called and said, it was like 2008, nine, everything was going crazy. We need money. And you seem to know everybody. And I'm like, what? How does DreamWorks need money? And he goes, we, we really need money. So I said, it's funny. I was talking to CJ from the SunTrust Bank. And man, we'll, we'll fly out. So I flew out the next day. And I got to see, we ended up, and it was announced. This is all public. Um, we did a $150 million debt deal for DreamWorks. And it, it made the headlines over the $700, million, $700 billion, you know, uh, financing for the whole world, <laughs> that was on the front page and that was on like four pages later. But what I learned from there was even guys like Steven Spielberg learning the film side of the world was they didn't really understand business as much as I thought they would. And I also realized some of when I dug into this even further, how diverse audiences were really not being paid attention to in the film, finance, TV world. So I dove into that uh, over the next Six years, I financed about $2 billion in film and television. Um, I learned a really critical thing during that process, which is rights. Um, there was YouTube around then. There was television. And in that time frame, a friend of mine named Ted Sarandos that works at Netflix, I used to sell them at my old company, DVD, game DVDs. And I would go pick up my check from his house, and I'm like, hey, what do you do? You know? And he's like, oh, we're going to do this streaming thing. And I'm like, I don't know what that is, but good luck, right? And... And, um, but what they did while I was doing film finance, they created a new window called SVOD, AVOD, whatever you want to call it for people in there. It's between digital, then there's SVOD, AVOD now, and television. When Netflix first started, they had to buy television rights. Too expensive, they wanted to find a way to get their, their pricing down. And there's importance to it, it's in a minute. So when they went from digital, SVOD, television, and then there was international rights. Whenever you make a piece of content and you want to license it throughout those windows. Um, what I realized when I started, when I fast forward when I started my company was, I'm not going to beat YouTube. <laughs> Netflix was far out in front of me. Um, television, I'm not going to beat the mainstays on television. International, I wasn't really international. So where could I play? And what I found when I was doing a lot of these contracts, there was something called non-theatrical that bundled up everything else in the world. But I knew everybody at the studio, so I created my own window called Closed Circuit Rights. So what I, by, by creating my own window, uh, for all the legal people here understand how important this is, I was able to walk in and get, sit at the table when any piece of content is being distributed or licensed, they call me from my rights window. Because the only person in my window really is me, because I kind of made it up and, <laughs> and legalized it and put it together. And I bought content before I even had a network, just so I could exercise the rights window. So um, that's kind of how I got to figuring this out. Um, and I did that before I even launched Reach TV. I was investing in digital signage companies and trying to explain to people that ran software companies that needed hardware and hardware people that needed software and realize none of them know anything about content and um, decided in 16, I actually decided in 15 to write a business plan and originally I was gonna give it to somebody then so I can help them do it and I decided to do it myself. So um, 2016 launched Reach in April. Um, I did a very important exercise for myself. I went to all the people that do all the financing to see if the rumors I, the things I thought I knew were true I got a lot of, can you prove the model? Which was kind of odd since I've exited seven companies already. I would think I am the, the model, but you know, I was still getting that. And luckily for me, I was able to just self-finance. I didn't care. Now all of those people call me all the time. I should have invested, I should have invested. And um, that's bigger. one of the bigger problems we have. There's not enough people like us sitting on the other side of the table when you go to get financing. So. 
you know, my job has lately has been trying to bring people like us into uh, private equity firms and venture firms so that they can actually fund the other people. And I don't think this is a knock, but you, you give money to people you know and people who are around your circle. So if you're not in whatever circle you're in, it's easier. I know it's, people. It's a team. Exactly. Right. Yeah, it's a team. It's just your community. If, you're, if, uh -huh. if that's who you hang out with, that's who you're going to finance, that's who you're going to trust. Um, we just got to get more of our people in that community so that we can build our inner communities inside of there. Um, but if you fast forward to where we are now, I think for us, for Reaches, we are doing a lot of things that are innovative. It's, it's, it was, I'm not going to tell you, it was hard. There was multiple times. The pandemic happened. We went to zero. I mean, my entire business went from one day having 50 million people to zero. And uh, we didn't let go of anybody. We didn't do PPP loans. We restructured our business. Um, and we sp focused on innovation and innovation only. We had every Friday, just forget about what you know, what would you love to happen? And then from there, so many ideas came out. And, and then in 21, we acquired what was CNN Airport is now ours. So we bought that uh, in 21. And, and then we fast forward to where we are today. I just think that for, for me, being at the conference like this was really just to let people know that there's plenty of us doing this work. We just have to bring our communities together. Yeah. There is a tremendous amount of collaboration between black, Latino, and Asian mm -hmm. owners and uh, executives that I've seen in the last 10 years that quad 10 times what it was the years before. Yeah. So there's a lot of help out there to reach out to other people for help. And, um, you know, I think there's... Yeah, I'm always inspired by other people. I, I can tell you 10 other companies that I'm watching that I'm inspired by and excited for. And I think there's just a lot of opportunity in this country, in what we do. I just think that, you know, we have to understand Instagram's not real, right? Like it does, you don't start a business tomorrow and then all the next, next thing you know, you have no, $10 million dollars and you no, bought NBC. I, I, there was a funny one that I was, that one had me laughing, but... Um, the, the, the reason I say that is it takes a lot of grit. And funniest part about that word, when you look at it, when I think about the grit, who has naturally has grit, it's usually the most diverse people around. Because mm -hmm. we've dealt with it every day of our life and we're so used to it. Mm -hmm. It's the most important function, I think, in business is that grit. Mm -hmm. Because you don't let things bother you and you're not mm -hmm. easily tough. defeated uh -huh. and you're tough. And um, in my office, when people ask me how I'm doing, if there's somebody from my office is here, they would tell you. Mm -hmm. They can answer it for me. I'm good. I'm breathing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's just literally my baseline of how I'm, when people ask me how I'm doing. So um, I just think that we have to have more positivity. We are the grit. Be, be aggressive. And, and I'm, I mean, uh, I'm just excited to be here. So. Thank you for being here. Does anyone have any questions? Yes. Just give me one second. I know that was a lot. <laughs> thank you. Hello, hello. Uh, Linwood, thank you. I think it's uh, so much of what you said resonated with uh, in terms of understanding the game and kind of coming from the outside and not seeing how the game is played until you're in it. Um, in terms of music and film, right, there seems to be a lot of money going into rights, right? Rights and a lot of private equity kind of buying up catalogs. But you mentioned there's a gap on that kind of before that, which is kind of the companies building the content and building the, the frameworks and the technology to do that. And as, as a music tech founder, of course, no, I think there's a lot of, a lot of uh, in, in VC especially, there's a lot of like, eh, what's, it's, I wouldn't say discrimination, but it's, I don't think they get it. Or they, maybe you can speak to what's going on. Um, maybe they see something that we don't. Um, um, well, I can tell you, I'm intimately involved in multiple guys that are uh, on the catalog side. Um, there's a couple of things. Number one is they're doing their own calculations on the backside of what that revenue is going to come in, and it's simply a numbers game. They don't even, they're not even looking at you as a, as a founder, as a person. They're looking at it as a number, and that number is going to bring back this X, Y, Z. So that's one part of them that's over there. The second part is um, they may be already interested or investing in something like you, so be really careful about, especially now on the innovation side of what you're putting in front of people, because they're, look, they're invested heavily in this space, 
And a lot of times they invested because they knew somebody, like I said earlier, but that somebody doesn't understand that there's 11 patents on your platform. Mm -hmm. And now they're infringing on those patents today. And they had no idea you even existed yesterday. So there's, there's some of that. And the other part of it is, uh, you know, depending on who you're talking to, um, you know, they don't get what you see. And uh, there's two reasons, there's two things I would say to that. I don't always blame other people on that. Maybe you're just gonna keep refining what, you're, what you wanna, how you want that to come across. And I, I would ask the question, I always ask people, so give me a recap of what I said to you you know, after a meeting's over, hey, just quickly, I'm just trying to understand what do you think my business is so I make sure we're, we're aligned. You'd be surprised how many times they don't really understand your business. Got it. Does anyone have? Yeah, I'll be right there. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you so much for taking the time out of, I'm sure, your busy day to meet with us today. Um, please be patient with me because I'm hoping that you would be able to see. Well, you're a very bright man. I think you would. So I'm listening to you and I'm hearing about all of the exciting transitions that you have made from ground zero to a pinnacle and during the pandemic coming back down to ground zero and then reshooting your shot again and getting there. But on my way in by Uber this morning to the meeting, I was seeing all of the construction going on in the city. And based on my son being in music, I have been privileged to travel to different cities and seeing the same thing. A lot of exciting new construction, businesses, banks, and other you know types of construction moving into those areas. So I'm always asking the question, did this used to be a black community? And the answer is almost inevitably, yes. And so I was talking to the Uber driver and, I, and he said, yeah, man, you always see, you know, they come in, they take over. I'm wondering, a man like you, with your level of intelligence, innovativeness, are we working together, Hispanics, African-Americans, uh, Haitians, are we working together to try to use our gifts, our ability to work with finance, to um, you know, have monies or people with money in our network to basically own this property? Property as we know is leverage. And if we own the property, individuals can't come in and so easily move us when we're the owners. And so I see you and I'm admiring you and I'm just so impressed. There are other people like Jay-Z and other, other excellent uh, people who are brilliant minds. Are we forming the network to work together, secure property so we just can't be moved all around? Um, and the last point, the compliments that is, in my own community, we have an Asian uh, community. Almost every city you go to, the Asians have their own community. The Jews have their own community. But the African American community and the Hispanic community, it's like missing. Why do I need another Asian community in my community? I already have one. What are we doing wrong? What, why uh, is it that we have individuals like you who are so brilliant my question is, are we working together to secure property so we won't be so easily moved and dismissed? Uh, well, I'm gonna, you have a, a couple good questions in there, yeah, and I'm question. trying to unlock and make sure I get to all of them. Um, first of all, I'm going to say something very blunt. We weren't collaborative in our own community, and we weren't supportive of each other for a long time. Many reasons, many books about why that was, but those are just facts. You know, we... we I lived in a neighborhood, I grew up in Jersey, and where there was businesses that were black owned that were not supported as much as other businesses right next door. So that's something that we had inherently in between us um, that I see moving away, but it is still some semblance of that there. Um, when you talk about people buying up properties and buying up communities and buying them up, 
there's a couple things that go on there, and some of the biggest, wealthiest people in the world are doing that. When you look at Florida, for example, I saw some stat the other day, like 60% of the, the individual homes are being owned by like Blackwater and, and Blackstone and these big private equity firms. Uh, that's not just, that, that, the power of that is, is leverage and where they're seeing and what they want to do is move everyone to a uh, renter economy and where they own the property and you just rent from them. And that's an amortization play on you know, how they're looking at it from a finance standpoint. Um, there's a lot of guys out there who are creating funds. Um, there's a culture of creatives. Uh, Charles King out in L.A., who I'm tight with. There's a guy named Carlton Jenkins, who I'm tight with, that, that formed and is now on the board of the largest black bank. So there's, there's, there's lenders out there. Robert Smith is creating a fund for certain you know, tech, um, women in tech, uh, AI, and training, specifically going into the black community to give skills. Uh, he put $2 billion into that fund, and it's moving that into creating offices around to, in black communities. Um, we are literally, I'm in a group that's setting up funds to, to fund black women uh, in tech, uh, different types of organizations throughout. Um, but that is kind of my purpose and my, and my passion uh, outside of what I do for a living is how do we have people sitting on the other side of the table that know how to look at our cultural things and how important they are. Like an outside party sometimes doesn't understand the value of a beauty salon and a black community. Right? They may not invest, they may not see the return, but they don't understand how much that beauty salon can affect everything else. Products, um, what films go, people go to see. They don't understand how much culturally relevant barbershops and beauty salons are. So how do we take those, and I got this from Richard Hamlet from Jeffries, how do we get those together and how do we create a network on top of them so that there are more power in all of them together than each individual? And that's kind of what I see some people building. Well, Shelton is building that. I'm partnering with him to make sure that that's done. Brands like P&G are coming in because they see the power of our community. And what that, at the end of the day, if you want to talk about what America's built on, where everybody's looking, forget about diversity and spend and all that for a second. Growth, right? The growth is in delivering, uh, servicing underserved communities. Our communities are underserved. So if you look at where the people are underserved, that's where the opportunity is. And that's why you see so many people wanting to come into those neighborhoods, come into around our culture, mimic the culture. And it's where we got to find the ways to own it and stay in ownership. Um, so that's really what we're, we're getting to an ultimate thing is we've been underserved so long, but we spend so much. And we keep the studies out there all over the place, but the black dollar lasts in our community 24 minutes. Whereas an Asian dollar lasts in their community 74 days. We got to figure out ways to keep our money in our communities a little longer to help support our own businesses before it goes out of our community. So that's just, a, it's, it's going to take some work. It's going to take some creativity, but there's a whole bunch of little things in there that impact what you were asking. But great questions. Anyone else has a question? Yes. yes. Regional Miami airport is very, very controlled by by like, by like um, local interests. Mm -hmm. How do you how did you how did you kind of take these rights and and do something as broad as get all airports to use your your um, network? You got to look at so when I write a business plan, part of the thing was I knew that right there was a company called Clear TV. I saw where they. They had really good content, but they were paying TV rights. It doesn't, you know, there's not enough revenue to support that. That was an ego play. So they went out of business, but the model was right. Um, getting a contract from the city, as anybody in the government knows, those take time. They're RPs. They could be two years, three years. I didn't want to wait. So what I did was who else operates in the airport that I could partner with to scale me quickly? And then I went to the food and beverage operators and I started with HMS Host, the largest one. Um, got them to get, let me launch in three airports. We quickly in one year went to 62 with them. And then I just filled in with all the other concessionaire partners. So by the time anybody knew I, where, what I was doing and who I was, I was already in 70-something airports and, and had six, 700 venues locked in. 
And then there was no way to pull me out because I was integrated in to the people that make those airports money. So that was my reverse way in uh, to make sure that nobody could kick me out because I knew they would as soon as they found out. Uh, and also, I, I did something else that I knew that the airports have. There's two things. When you travel, you're stressed and uh, you feel guilty. So what I did was the stress part, you don't want to add to it by airing news, so we don't do any of that. And I knew how much they hated CNN and Fox in the airport, so they just wanted positivity and fun. So I kept that as part of my motto. And then um, stress, we were in the stores where you're buying gifts for people. I mean, guilt, where you're buying gifts. So we really highlighted beauty products for your wife and colognes for the, the, you know, for the husbands and you know, gifts for the kids. And we would run those promos all over the place. So we became this fun, cool network. Um, and that was, I was our sneak code in. And then we acquired CNN Airport, who already had the rights. So when I bought CNN, I bought all their equipment, all their rights, took over their contracts, and then we delivered the service, which they then extended because they liked our service. Hi, Dan O'Connor from Fireframe AI. Hey. A big theme of the conference has been AI and how it's changing the industry. I'm just curious if there's anything in your business that you're, any trends that you're excited to see developing in the AI landscape or you're concerned about? Um, well, I'll go backwards. I've been using what your people are calling AI now for about six, seven years. We use it um, more to determine what ads we're gonna run and when uh, based on devices and everything that's in the area. So we kind of love it. I've actually been playing with the other way, is now putting in content in a way that if there's six people that, I, when I look at their, their mobile, that they're really interested in fashion, I'd run the fashion content, not the uh, Rich Eisen show over here, right? So we've been playing with it and using it in that manner for, what, for a long time. Um, the problem with it for me right now is the data going in. I am very concerned with the data going in. Um, I was having a conversation around legal I have a bunch of friends that are lawyers. They don't even use, they can't even use it yet. It, it doesn't even state the right cases, even though you would think that would be the easiest one, but there's so much interpretation that, that AI can't do yet. Um, same thing for medical. There's a lot of interpretation is just not there yet. And um, I see people using it like it's Bible, and I'm like, it's not quite there yet. Um, and then when it comes to minorities, I'm seeing a lot of misinformation into it. And I'm a little, the part I'm nervous about is, it's moving so fast, who's correcting it, right? And that's kind of, kind of the government things where we say government has to move at a pace, but technology moves at a way faster pace. Uh, and they take advantage of the fact that they know they're going faster. And I think that's where it's gonna be tough is really all of us collectively have to say no. We, we need to make sure this is accurate and we need to pressure them the plat the, uh, forget the government for a second. Go directly to the platforms and say this is wrong. You gotta. We need to update it. I see a lot of pressure on Facebook about a lot of their AI meta stuff because it was just wrong. And and then there's certain pl platforms. There even their imagery of us is off. I loaded a picture of me. It doesn't look nothing like me coming back out. All right, because they can't read it yet. So we just got to figure. That's the part of AI to me is it's all based on data going in. Who's checking that? Would you like anything to conclude? Uh, simply saying that thank you for having me here today. Um, I, I think that the future is, there's a lot of opportunity out there. I think that if, I would tell everybody who, if you're a publisher, sell products, right? It, the, the way to build a connection with people is to sell products. So if you're in music, maybe sell some of your merchandise and, and really build a relationship one-to-one. -one. AI can't replace that type of relationship. You know, and that's kind of where people are, they can replace a story, they can't replace a relationship. Um, and I think that there's, don't be afraid of AI, figure out ways to use it. Don't be afraid of whatever else is going on. I think there's opportunities in the cracks. And anybody who's nimble, uh, it gives you an opportunity to create your own business, especially in this country, you can create your own business and you can find ways and do what you want. Um, I don't believe in the notion of whoever's president, it doesn't really affect me. Um, I look at the local guys, I vote for mayors, councilmen, I look for people in my local committee that I can support and vote for. Um, I think that's where we should focus and you know, I'm a very positive person so to me life is great and there's all kinds of opportunities if you just kind of you know, take the time. And the last thing I leave every conference with is do the work. Don't, don't come back to me and say yeah. it didn't work. 
when you didn't write the business plan and you didn't put the effort in, and I ask at every conference, send me your business plan, I'll give you some feedback. And if you don't have a business plan uh, format, I'll send it to you, just email me. I usually get one person max that emails me for it, and then I usually get one every three conferences that I get a business plan. So to me, there's a lot of people that say they want to do stuff, and not a lot of people don't want to do the work. Do the work, but then the work is so true. Thank you so much, Lynn Wood. Round of applause, guys, thank you. It was a pleasure.